Okay, uh, we're going to uh, pick up with uh, back to chapter seven. As I sent out an announcement, uh, there's a recording of uh, last part of chapter nine. Actually, a couple of them. Uh, one's really short; it's like twenty minutes. Last couple of examples, and then the previous one there. Uh, this should keep us on pace for our experiments and stuff this week. Uh, so we talked about a majority of uh, chapter seven. And obviously, make sure that you do uh, watch those videos there from Chapter 9. <clears throat> so uh, we talked about a majority of Chapter 7 the first time through. And uh, in this chapter, we talked about... We talked about uh, types of reactions and ways to classify reactions. And remember that, as we talked about, there's really two big categories of reactions. Uh, there's double displacement reactions. Uh, which you can recognize as really two ionic compounds. That's, so that is for sure how you know you have a double displacement reaction happening. And always in this reaction, Really, the two positive guys will switch partners and form new ionic compounds on the other side of the arrow. And this is really what we're going to sort of be focusing on here for the rest of chapter. We kind of skipped ahead earlier on. Uh, remember, the other sort of one is our redox reactions, uh, which cover uh, electrons being transferred. And those are all those uh, combustion, uh, synthesis, decomposition, single replacement reactions uh, that we talked about. Uh, but we're going to kind of come back here to our double displacements, which uh, basically account for uh, really one or two sort of products being formed, uh, either a solid or a precipitate being formed, or basically water being formed. And as you remember, these three things here, are really the three reasons why any type of reaction takes place, uh, that electron transfer, some type of solid, or water being formed. Uh, so we're going to look closer at the double displacement. We're also going to talk about, again, how we decide whether or not we will get a solid or not uh, when we do this type of reaction. So first off, uh, let's talk a little bit about aqueous solutions. And <clears throat> a solution is a homogeneous mixture and solutions are the ones that do get the aqueous symbol next to them in their formulas. And aqueous does mean some type of water environment. And a solution is really made up of two parts. It is a solute, uh, which is the smaller part of the solution. And it is the solvent, which is the larger part of the solution. And really those two things are mixed together to make a mixture. And a homogeneous mixture, as we talked about, is something that when it does mix, everything mixes, it looks the same throughout. Uh, a reminder, and I think we might have talked about this previously, but there is, again, a difference between liquid and aqueous, even though they're both really in the same state, which is sort of the liquid state. Uh, when we do have a liquid, it is some type of pure substance by itself. Like if we had water, it would have the liquid sort of symbol next to it. If we and mix it to sodium chloride. Uh, the sodium chloride would dissolve in the water and that would then get us a solution that would get the aqueous symbol and we would end up with a sodium chloride solution. And again, uh, the solute here is the sodium chloride in this example. Our solvent is water. And if you're not really sure what the solute is, uh, it pretty much is the name of the solution. So whatever the name of the solution is, it's always going to be the solute. If it's an ionic compound, uh, probably a fairly good chance that water is going to be the solvent. Uh, water is not always the solvent, uh, but it works really well and mixes really well with things that are ionic and also things that are polar. Uh, as we'll talk about in later chapter, water is a pretty crappy uh, solvent for something that's nonpolar. They really don't mix really well uh, together. So uh, although in a lot of cases, water is typically the solvent, does not necessarily always have to be the solvent, but 
probably a fairly good shot that if it's ionic, it's going to be probably water that is the solvent that's in there. So <clears throat> when we take solutions uh, and mix them together, we oftentimes will get that double displacement reaction, either a precipitate being formed, which is a solid, or uh, water being formed, which happens in an acid-base reaction. Now, a reminder that when we talk about reactions that occur in solutions, electrolytes are really important. And electrolytes, I think we touched upon in an earlier chapter, but electrolytes, once again, are substances that when they are dissolved in water, uh, they will basically break apart into ions. And that's really important. Um, they will produce ions in solution. And because they're able to produce ions in solution, uh, they're able to conduct electricity. And there's different types of electrolytes. Uh, again, there are strong electrolytes. And strong electrolytes 100% break apart in solution. So if you took something like our sodium chloride solution, in solution, it really is sodium ions and chloride ions that are floating around. You have basically 100% these guys in solution. You pretty much have none of the sodium chloride units still together when it's in solution. So if you were to look at it, Pretty much all you got in there are these ions that are basically floating around in the solution um, and none of the whole units still together. Um, <clears throat> most ionic compounds are strong electrolytes, which means when they go for a swim, you could pretty much expect them to completely break apart into their ions. Uh, also, acid and bases are also strong electrolytes, um, things like strong acids and bases and a good list. And I think I might put it up earlier, but once again, um, this list of strong acids is a really good one to know as you continue through your chemistry life here, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydriotic acid. So this list of six strong acids uh, is a really good one to commit to memory as you go through chemistry. Uh, and the reason for that is pretty much if you could identify something as an acid and it's not one of these six, it's probably a fairly good shot that it's going to be a weak uh, acid or a weak electrolyte. Uh, so you could use this as sort of your way to eliminate things that are not uh, strong acids. Strong bases typically will have hydroxide in them, like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. Uh, pretty much if you kind of go on the periodic table there and kind of go group one over to potassium to calcium and down, any of those guys that have hydroxide connected to them in group one or group two, uh, typically are strong bases. So you kind of go down, hang a right at calcium and come back down a little bit. All those guys hooked up with hydroxide typically are going to make your strong bases. And again, group one is the alkali metals. Group two is the alkaline earth metals. And the word alkaline means basic. Uh, so that's where a lot of our strong bases come from. So any of these guys that are strong acids or strong bases along with ionic compounds when they are in solution, they pretty much are going to completely break apart from one another. And uh, you pretty much have nothing but ions kind of floating around in solution, which is really important for what happens when we mix some solutions together. There are some weak electrolytes and weak electrolytes will mainly stay together. but will produce a few ions. So since they're able to kind of produce still a few ions, uh, they're considered electrolytes, but they're definitely weak electrolytes. They're not gonna produce anywhere near the amount of, elect of ions that a strong electrolyte will produce. Because frankly, all a strong electrolyte has to do is go in for a swim and it's gonna produce a bunch of ions really quickly. 
Weak electrolytes, on the other hand, they got to do some work. They're going to basically stay apart, but break apart a little bit into some ions. So, for example, if you took something like hydrofluoric acid, hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid and also a weak electrolyte that will break apart a little bit into its ions. But it will mainly stay together here. And that means if you look at something that is hydrofluoric acid, what you mainly have in that solution is actually the HF guy still together, but you got a little bit of the individual ions kind of floating around in that particular solution. We also could recognize a weak electrolyte by these arrows that head it up by a reversible reaction, uh, whereas it goes to the right there, that is what is referred to as the forward direction. And at some point, once you build up enough products, they actually will recombine and go back the other way and make some of our reactants back. And that is different than with a strong electrolyte. Strong electrolyte is pretty much a one-way street. Everybody's going to the product side. They're all going to dump out into ions. Uh, there's nobody coming back the other way. So that's a really main difference. And most of those weak electrolytes, again, will stay together uh, in solution rather than break apart into ions. Lastly, there's also non-electrolytes and non-electrolytes are things that will dissolve in solution, uh, like sugar, for example, uh, but will produce no ions. And because they produce no ions, non-electrolytes, uh, they will not conduct electricity. Again, uh, those ions are really the crucial part there to allow it to conduct uh, electricity. <clears throat> Any questions on any of that there? So this is really important to be able to sort of identify strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, and non-electrolytes uh, when you're dealing with certain types of equations that we want to write when we're dealing with double displacement reactions, and also to some extent, uh, single replacement reactions as well. So as I mentioned earlier, water is pretty safe bet for most ionic compounds going to be the solvent. And water is a really good solvent because as we know from bonding, water is a polar molecule. Hopefully we know that. And the oxygen side is more negative on water and the hydrogen side is more positive. So when we actually go to dissolve something, that is ionic, it works really well with ions uh, because again, a positive ion like sodium and sodium chloride uh, will be surrounded by the oxygen side of water. While say the negative ion there like the chloride would also be attracted to water, but actually the hydrogen side of water as it is the more positive side in this particular case. And that is essentially how we get something like sodium chloride to basically dissolve in water. Uh, it's also why it is a physical change when we make a solution. Remember homogeneous mixtures are physical changes uh, because we can't get back everything um, from that mixture. So in a case of this, we could heat this up like we did in some of those earlier experiments this semester where you had the evaporating dish and you got rid of all of the water and eventually the solid came back, the ionic compound came back after all the water basically dissolved. So what happens though, is there's just a sheer amount of water present uh, when you go to dissolve something. And eventually we sometimes mistakenly think that some type of chemical reaction is taking place because we can no longer visually see, say the sodium chloride there, uh, but it's still there. It's just trapped behind a ton of water uh, which makes it not visible to us anymore. Um, and again, we know it's there, as I just mentioned, because when we do heat it up, we evaporate off all these water molecules and that allows this really strong attractive force between those ions uh, basically to have nothing in its way and it's going to allow it to come back together, which is why you then would re-see the solid after you evaporated off the water. The process of dissolving happens and we help it along, right? Because usually when we go to dissolve something, we stir it. And as we stir it, we're just throwing tons of water molecules all over that ionic solid. 
before it, we dissolve it, the ionic solid is basically together you know, in this sort of three-dimensional structure. And as we kind of throw on all these water molecules on there, uh, they basically have enough to pluck those guys away from each other, uh, even though that's an incredibly strong attractive force between the ions. Just the sheer amount of water that's present allows them basically to pop each of those ions off and basically go into solution. And that's essentially when we write something like aqueous down, that's essentially what we are sort of referring to in solution. Uh, that is pretty much what aqueous means is there's water surrounded by it. We typically don't put them in the formulas uh, unless you take one B at some point, you might put some of them into the formulas, but uh, you could have a formula where people would write the waters in but it gets really crowded. So instead of kind of putting them into the formula, we just put the aqueous next to it to imply that those ions or ionic compounds are in solution and basically freely floating around in there uh, with the water. We also, as we stir it to mix it, provide enough energy, right, to kind of help the process of it dissolving. And as you might know, if something doesn't dissolve, that's a solid in a liquid, sometimes you could heat it up and add a little bit more energy and stir it some more, and that will help the process of it to dissolve. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so that process is uh, what is sometimes referred to as hydration, uh, where those water molecules basically get around each of those ions and help that process of dissolving. And again, also helps sort of buffer each of those ions from each other from allowing the solid to reform. So as I mentioned before, acid and bases are also electrolytes. And <clears throat> when we have a strong electrolyte, like those six sort of acids that we put up there, uh, we do expect them to be 100% uh, broken apart. So when we take something like hydrochloric acid here, in solution, we pretty much have 100% of these guys here. We pretty much have none of the hydrochloric acid. And that is basically means that when we put some hydrochloric acid or have hydrochloric acid, uh, we basically have a ton of these ions floating around. And that's pretty much what makes something an acid is the ability to produce H plus in solution, uh, freely floating around in that particular solution. And that's the same thing when we have something like our, say, potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base. In solution, we would have 100% potassium ions and hydroxide ions present. And that would mean that in solution, we pretty much have 100% of just these ions floating around. And we got none of those units still together. And that's really what makes something a strong base or a base in general is that ability to produce hydroxide. Again, freely floating around in solution, not attached to anything else. Outside of that list of six acids, pretty much if you see something that is an acid like what we have here, uh, which is acetic acid, that is a weak acid and it will mainly stay together. So if we had our solution of acetic acid, we pretty much have the actual acid still together. But we do have a few of the ions that have broken apart. So because it's still able to produce some H plus in solution that's free, it is still considered an acid, but definitely a weak acid versus our strong acid like hydrochloric acid that just needs to go for a swim to produce that H plus. Here, it's got to break apart and will produce a very minimal amount of H plus compared to something like HCl. Not all uh, acids or not all bases have hydroxide in it. So very common weak base that you most often come across is ammonia. Ammonia is the, probably the most common weak basis you'll see. And what happens with ammonia is when it reacts with water, it will actually take an H plus from water and that will produce NH4 plus and some hydroxide. So in the case of ammonia, 
it will mainly be NH3 in there, but it has the ability to react with water and produce a little bit of free OH minus in that solution, which makes it still a base, but is a much, much weaker base than something like potassium hydroxide, which is going to produce a lot of OH minus really quickly as soon as it goes into solution. So whenever we have these weak electrons, again, it's these arrows that head in both directions. And as I mentioned earlier, as we go from reactants to products, that is what is referred to as the forward direction. At some point, we will gain enough products that they will head in the opposite direction, which is what is referred to as the reverse direction and a reversible reaction. So unlike our strong electrolytes, which is a one-way street that we got back and forth, and it will continue to go until it reaches what is referred to as chemical equilibrium. And as you will take maybe 1B, that which is pretty much all that class is about, chemical equilibrium. Uh, equilibrium doesn't necessarily mean equal like the name may imply. And sometimes people have the wrong idea that uh, what it means when it reaches chemical equilibrium is you got like the same amount on each side of the arrow. And that's not what it means. It's actually referring to the rate. And what it's referring to is the rate of the forward direction will eventually equal the rate of the reverse direction in that reaction. So basically just as quick as it will go to products, those products will just as quickly recombine and head the other way. The net result of that is when something reaches equilibrium is it locks everybody into place in terms of their concentration, are their pressures if you're dealing with gases, as to wherever they're at. They're basically gonna be able to maintain that as long as you don't screw up the equilibrium, you'll have basically the same concentration of reactants and products as to what they were when it reached equilibrium. Again, it doesn't mean that you have the same numbers of reactants and products or same amount on both sides, but they will rate it as it goes forward and reverse will equal each other. And that will lock everybody basically into place. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So as I mentioned, uh, we're going to kind of really focus here on the double displacement as we did a lot of information uh, about redox the previous time, our double displacement, which basically are going to be our precipitation reactions and our acid and base reactions. And remember, that's pretty much our solid being formed and water being formed. Our redox, as we talked about, is our electron transfer. And those more specific classifications that we talked about, our combustion reaction, our synthesis reaction, our decomposition reaction, and our single replacement. So we're going to focus in on uh, these two reactions here and look at them a little bit more specifically. And also talk about how we know we get a solid or not a solid and what's really happening when we do these type of reactions. So let's take a look first off at precipitation reactions. In a precipitation reaction, <clears throat> it is characterized by some type of precipitate or solid that is made. And again, a precipitate is sometimes abbreviated as a PPT. And this is again going to be a result of our ion switching partners when they come to the other side. And again, one of these guys will make a solid in this case, which is a precipitate. So very similar to the yellow stuff that you made the other week, right? When you kind of mix it together, you got a led to iodide that basically occurred. So when we look at these precipitation reactions, uh, really it is the precipitate that is the main thing that is happening. It really is the reaction that is taking place. And we can really analyze closer as to what is going on here. So if we take a look at this reaction here, which is pretty much the one I think we did the other week, um, we have our lead to nitrate, uh, plus our sodium iodide going to make our lead to iodide and our sodium nitrate. Once again, you should be able to recognize this as a double displacement reaction as these two guys are ionic compounds and there's pretty much nobody else that makes 
a reaction like this when you start with a double displacement reaction. This means that the lead here is going to end up with the I and the sodium is going to end up with the nitrate. It is also really important as we talked about when we talked about balancing equations, writing equations, uh, that you put together on the product side, the correct formula, and then you should balance the equation. Again, you don't wanna do that at the same time. So that is why we get to PBI2 because the lead in this case on the left is a plus two, the I is a minus one. So when we put that together, we get a PBI2. Also why we get this formula here, because the sodium is a plus one and the nitrate is a minus one. So the proper formula is NaNO3, not like Na2, NO32 or anything weird like that. So once you do have the proper formulas down, uh, as we talked about, then you wanna go back and balance everybody using the coefficients. So when we have this equation here, it shows us really what compounds are reacting. We have the proper formulas here, and this guy should be aqueous here. But we can write another equation that really describes sort of what is happening when we basically toss these two solutions into a beaker. So if we had a beaker here and we're going to toss these guys in, we got a little lead to nitrate going in. We got a little sodium iodide going in for a swim. What's going to happen is because this is an ionic compound, it is going to 100% break apart in solution. So in solution, what we really have is a lead ion that has a plus two charge. We also have two of these nitrates, which is that little two on the bottom. It actually goes to the front when we write this type of equation. And we actually have two of those nitrates that are floating around. The sodium iodide here is also a strong electrolyte, which means it will break apart. And the two that's in front actually gets uh, moved to each of those guys. So that will give us two sodium ions that are floating around and two iodide ions that are floating around. When we come across the arrow, what we end up with is a solid that is right here. And because it's a solid, it means, frankly, it is not floating around. They have come together. They have joined to make this solid or precipitate. And that means that when we write this type of equation, we actually will keep a solid together. Now, typically speaking, when we write this type of equation, anything that is a solid, anything that is a pure liquid, anything that is a weak electrolyte, like we were talking about previously, you would actually keep together. You would not break apart because that is how they are found basically in the solution. And our sodium nitrate here at the end, also a strong electrolyte will break apart into a couple of sodium ions and a couple of nitrate ions. This equation that I just wrote is what is sometimes referred to as the total ionic equation. or some people call it the complete ionic equation. So basically when we toss this in, we got some lead ions floating around, we got some nitrate ions floating around, we have some sodium ions, and we have some iodide ions in this case. Now, when we write this equation, as I mentioned before, anything that is a weak electrolyte, a solid, a liquid, and in most cases, a gas will stay together. Anything that is a strong electrolyte will break apart into ions. So in addition to that, it's also really important in this equation, it is a total ionic equation, which means that anything here that is an ion should also have charges. And that's a super common error people make. 
is that they forget to actually write the charges for anything that is an ion. So if it is an ion that you're writing the formula for, which is commonly what you should be writing, at least most of it there in the total ionic equation, you should have the charges that are there as well. And you should have the proper coefficients to balance everything out if you did it correctly. First off, any questions on that equation there? <clears throat> Now, when we look at it, this is really sort of what is happening in the solution when we toss those ions in there. When we look at the total ionic equation, we should always be able to find ions on both sides of the arrow, which look identical to each other. So in this case, if you look, you got some nitrate on the left and we got nitrate on the right, which are identical to one another. Uh, we also have some sodium on the left, and we have some sodium on the right, which also look identical to each other. You also perhaps notice that it is the same number of those ions on each side of the equation, and that's also a good way to check yourself because you should always have the same number of ions on each side of these type of guys. These guys here are what are referred to as spectator ions. And if you are a spectator, you're pretty much just watching what's going on. You're not really involved in the product that's being made as a result of this reaction. And that is what happens in this case. So what we do with our spectator ions is you could think of the arrow as an equal sign and you could subtract them from both sides. And they should completely cancel out. And that's why you should always have the same number of spectator ions on each side because they pretty much should completely cancel out. What you are left with is what is really at the heart of this reaction, what is truly happening, which is it is the lead two ion that's going to go find the iodide ion. And they're going to come together to make this solid so really what's happening here is these two guys are going to find each other and they're going to come together and make this solid. I guess it's really more of a yellow solid than a blue solid, but they're going to come together here and make that solid. And what that means for our spectator ions, as you can see in my picture, they're just still floating around, having a good time, not really doing much. They're just kind of hanging out, floating around in the solution. But it's really those two other ions coming together to make the solid. And this equation here is what is referred to as the net ionic equation. This is the net ionic equation, which also should have charges written for things that are ions. And it should be balanced, which means I do have two iodides for every one lead ion that's going to come together. So our molecular equation shows what's happening when we mix these things together in a double displacement reaction with our normal formulas where we balance out the charges, no ions written. The total ionic equation basically represents what's truly happening when you dump it all together in a beaker. You got all these ions that are floating around. You have some ions that are gonna come together perhaps to make a solid, which is why it's a precipitation reaction. You get rid of your spectator ions, which are still floating around, not really making any type of solid. And what's left after you get rid of your spectator ions is ultimately the two ions that are going to come together uh, to make the actual solid product as a result of this reaction. And that is our net ionic equation. Any questions on any of those steps there? Yes. It is. So really the net ionic equation uh, net ionic equation um, in general, and it not always necessarily going to be a precipitation or precipitate that's made when you write a net ionic equation, but the net ionic equation pretty much tells you what exactly is happening in this reaction. And it's really going to be one of those three things that we talked about. It's going to be either a solid is going to be formed like this, or you'll end up with water being made at the end. And you could even write a net ionic equation for a redox reaction, like some of those ones we did, like a single replacement and stuff like that, which will show the electrons being transferred. So you could think of the net ionic equation as like we got rid of all the garbage in there, and this is really the things that's happening in this reaction that's going to lead to either a solid being made, water being made, or electrons being transferred, like in a redox reaction. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> oh. 
So as I mentioned earlier, um, you need to make sure you have charges. You also need to make sure you have the proper coefficients. And that comes from balancing the molecular equation and distributing the coefficients correctly and even the subscripts as well as you get to here. You should also have the states written, aqueous or solids. Once again, if it is a weak electrolyte, if it is a solid liquid or a gas in most cases, uh, you do not break it apart. So you still keep it together here in the total ionic equation and even the net ionic equation as well. All right, so there's our spectator ions. And then obviously we're left with our net ionic equation. <clears throat> All right, so how do we know if we're going to get a solid or not a solid uh, when we sort of mix sort of these ions together when they all go for a swim in the beaker? Uh, we could use the really the solubility of these things to help us decide whether or not we would expect when these ions come together, if we'll make a solid or not. And solubility is basically um, the idea of something is soluble. Uh, that means that essentially everything will mix. If we're talking about a solid and a liquid, the solid would dissolve. If we're also talking about two liquids together. The liquids will also mix uh, together as well. And there's sort of three categories of solubility. We have things that are soluble. And if something is soluble, that is pretty much the substances that get the aqueous symbol next to it. If we have, bless you, if we have something that is insoluble, that means that we would expect some type of solid to form. And those are the guys that get the solid sort of symbol next to it. And there is sort of a third category, which you might come across a little bit and occasionally. Uh, and that is what is sometimes referred to as being slightly soluble. So slightly soluble, most people consider it to be more hedging towards that substance being insoluble. So much like the name implies, slightly soluble means that a little bit of it will dissolve, but most of it will not dissolve. And that means that most people consider it to be insoluble. So we could use these guys and solubility rules really to help us determine when we put things together, should we expect it to be aqueous and a solution and no solid forming or that solid being formed. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some of these solubility rules here. So first off, these are rules of things that are typically soluble in water. And that means that most of these guys would get the aqueous symbol and we wouldn't expect a solid to form. The big couple rules are pretty much if you have anybody from group one on the periodic table, sodium, potassium, whatever it is there from group one, uh, it's going to be soluble in everything. There's no exception, which means as soon as you see that in a formula, you pretty much could write aqueous next to it. Yeah. You do need to know these rules. They want you to know it as you go through chemistry. Yeah, so we'll see another chart in a couple of slides that kind of summarize it all, all these rules together. And that might be a good one to look at, but you do need to know your solubility rules. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, then also uh, things that have ammonium in it. So if you see NH4 in your formula, that means it's going to be soluble no matter what it is hooked up to. You don't have to look any further. You pretty much could give it the aqueous symbol. You wouldn't expect a solid to form. Anything that contains nitrate, chlorate, perchlorate, you could add acetate to that as well. Uh, any of those guys, pretty much if you see in a formula, going to be aqueous. You don't have to look any further than that. Now, things that are chlorized, bromides, or iodized, so if it's got Cl, Br, or I in the formula, those things are typically going to be aqueous and soluble. But there actually are some exceptions. So it does matter in this case what the chloride, bromide, or iodide is hooked up with. So if it's hooked up with pretty much everybody, it's going to be soluble. But if it happens to be attached to one of these three guys here, uh, silver, that's mercury one, and that is lead two, is this going to be basically the opposite of soluble, which means it will be insoluble and would get a solid next to it. And you would expect a solid to form. 
So there are certain things that are soluble in a vast majority of things, but there are a few exceptions that if those guys are hooked up with them, then they would be insoluble, which would be the opposite. Sulfate, same deal. Sulfate is pretty much going to be soluble in most things, except for calcium or silver, which is considered slightly soluble, which again, most people would consider more on the insoluble side. And barium, mercury, two, and lead is going to be insoluble. So if you have any of these guys hooked up with sulfate, it wouldn't be aqueous, but it would be insoluble, which has the solid symbol next to it. So sometimes people also uh, get confused by the idea of the symbol of S or aqueous. So again, S means solid, which means insoluble. People oftentimes go soluble. I should put S, right? That kind of makes sense. Uh, but again, S is solid. So it actually goes with insoluble and things that are soluble that do mix will get the aqueous symbol. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Yeah, most people would just write S because again, most people would consider that to be more so insoluble. So they most likely will put uh, an S next to it. Yeah. Other questions? In tables and stuff, they'll sometimes write SS as being slightly soluble. So if you see like an SS in a table, it probably means slightly soluble, but the symbol in terms of the formula would probably be more of a solid symbol. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> So there's also some things that are typically insoluble. And these are guys that typically will make a solid. So hydroxides will typically make a solid, except if it is hooked up with a group one metal, which is pretty much the same rule as the previous slide. Group one are soluble in everything. So that will make soluble. But other than that, it would be insoluble. Carbon are going to be insoluble except if they're getting up with basically like the first couple of rules there on the previous table if they're hooked up with a group one or ammonium they're going to be soluble so you know that first couple of rules on the previous table apply to a lot of things that you see uh, here on the second table as well here is a uh, another table a little bit more uh kind of streamlined table of what you need to know. And obviously it says you need to know it. So I'm going to say you need to know it. So once again, everybody on the left here, if it is one of those situations should be aqueous and soluble, no solid forming. But if you got somebody on the left that's attached to somebody on the right, it becomes opposite and it would become a solid and it being insoluble. Guys on the left here are typically solids except if they're hooked up with somebody on the right, and then it would be the opposite. And those guys would then be aqueous and no solid. So um, this is probably not too bad of a table to know. And again, they do expect you to know your solubility rules as you roll through your different chemistry classes here at the school. So we'll say you need to know them as well for this class. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, so let's see how this works. So let's say we took... Let's say we took some um, barium nitrate and put it together with some uh, potassium sulfate. And let's say that we also put together some uh, sodium chromate and we pour it in there some iron three bromide. All right, so for each of these combinations, use your solubility rules here. And I want you to write the uh, balanced equation, molecular equation, the balanced total ionic equation, the balanced net ionic equation. And I want you to ID the spectator ions. 
All right, so take some time for both of those combinations. See what you come up with here. Okay, let's take a look to see how you're doing. So once again, when you're given uh, things in words, as we talked about, you wanna make sure that you are first starting out with the proper formulas. Uh, so that is barium nitrate. So barium is plus two and nitrate is minus one, which means we should end up with a formula that looks something like that. Uh, potassium sulfate, potassium is plus one, sulfate is minus two, which means we should end up with a formula that looks something like that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> This is a double displacement reaction. You should again be able to recognize that as our two ionic guys that are present. Remember, as we talked about, you wanna make sure that you first get the proper formulas before you try any of the balancing part. So that means that the barium here is gonna hook up here with the sulfate and that's a plus two and minus two that come together to give us BASO4. And then the potassium is going to uh, connect there with the nitrate. And again, the basic units of both of those is plus one and minus one, uh, which puts us with a KNO3. Once again, no K2NO32. You want to get the correct formulas first, and then you want to balance it. Any questions on that there? <laughs> yeah. It's a double displacement reaction because that's pretty much the only reaction where you will be starting with two ionic compounds. So that's definitely how you know it. All the other ones uh, pretty much will never have kind of two ionic compounds to start with. Other questions? Okay, so now that we have all the correct uh, formulas here, we want to then go back and balance it using our coefficients. And in this case, it looks like perhaps we need a two right about there. And I think that might be all we need. So we are balanced at that point. Uh, we also can use our solubility rules from the previous table to determine what is going on with each of these. So here we look at barium, which you might not find on that table, but it is attached to nitrate, which is right here. And it is pretty much soluble in everything. It doesn't matter who it is attached to. Uh, so we know that this guy is going to be aqueous and no solid is going to form. When we look at the next one, it is potassium, which if we look at our solubility rules, once again, potassium is group number one, which means it's soluble in everything. There's no exceptions. So really that's as far as you need to look. Uh, you could also look at the sulfate if you want, but really as soon as you hit that potassium, uh, there's really need to look at anything else. And we know that this guy is going to be aqueous. When we look over here at sulfate in this case, once again, it is soluble in everything except for a few exceptions. And in this case, it is actually one of the exceptions. Barium is an exception to that. So instead of normally being soluble, it will be the opposite of that. And it will be insoluble. And we would expect this guy to make a solid, which is the precipitate that's going to occur in this case. Now here we have potassium, our nitrate, and again, you could look at that table and pretty much either of those are going to be soluble in everything it hooks up with. Uh, so that will tell us that it is aqueous. Any questions on how to use the solubility table there to help you out? All right, now that we have our balanced molecular equation here with our states, we could write our total ionic equation, which is what is happening in solution and our strong electrolytes, which these ionic compounds are, will break apart into its ions. So this will break apart into a barium ion. This two will come up in front and we will get two nitrate ions for every one of those that goes for a swim. We will then get this two will come to the front, two potassium ions and one sulfate ion for every one of those that go into solution. Now this solid here is obviously a solid because those ions came together, which means they're no longer floating around freely in the solution. They kind of come together to make the solid. So we do not break apart it as it is a solid. So it will stay together. And this too gets distributed to everybody behind it as that's a strong electrolyte. 
and we will end up with two potassium ions and two nitrate ions in this case. This is the balanced total ionic equation in this case. Any questions on that one? Once again, as I mentioned earlier, for those guys that are ions in this equation, they have charges, they also have the states, and they have the correct coefficients that are in front of the ions as well. So when we look at this total ionic equation, once again, we should be able to look on both sides of the arrows or the arrow and find ions that are exactly the same. Uh, so we have a nitrate there and we got a couple of nitrates there. We also have potassium, a couple there and a couple there. Those are going to be our spectator ions in this case. So our spectator ions here, it's gonna be our potassium and our nitrate because they are spectator ions and they're basically just watching what is going on. We basically cancel them out. And once again, you should have the exact same number of those ions, equal numbers on each side. If you do not, then you definitely did something wrong in terms of balancing or writing the equation. What you are left with is going to be our net ionic equation. So we have a barium ion that's basically going and finding the sulfate. And those two guys are coming together to make our barium sulfate, which is the solid that was formed and really the purpose of this reaction. And this is our net ionic equation here. <clears throat> any questions on any of those steps there? Then let's look at the other combination and see what we got going on. So in this combination, we're taking sodium chromate. So sodium is plus one and chromate is minus two, which gives us Na2CrO4. Going to react it with iron three bromide. Iron has a plus three, Br has a minus one, which gives us this formula right here. And once again, to sort of the earlier question, we have our two ionic compounds here. So we know we're going to get this double displacement that's going to happen. And our positive guys are gonna switch partners. So in this case, the sodium and the bromide is gonna to come together and our iron and our chromate is gonna to come together. We once again, wanna make sure we get the proper formula. So sodium is plus one, Br is minus one. So that should give us NaBr. Once again, not Na2Br3 or anything weird like that. Over here, the next one is iron with a plus three charge and chromate with a minus two charge, which means we get Fe2CrO4-3 basically happening in this case. Any questions on that formula there? All right, so now that we have the right formulas down, we wanna make sure that we balance it and we're going to put a two perhaps there. That's gonna give us six of the BRs, maybe a three right about there. So we should be balancing it, again, using our polyatomic ions as a way to balance this much quicker than maybe going individual element by element. So now that we have the balance equation, we could use our solubility rules here to determine. So our first guy has sodium, which is pretty much soluble in everything. There's no exception. And that's gonna be our aqueous. We look at iron and bromine, and we do find bromine on the charts and it is soluble in everything except for these three guys, which is not the case here. So it's going to be soluble. As soon as I see the sodium, I really don't need to look any further because I know it's gonna be soluble in everything. And lastly here, we have chromate, which is insoluble, unless it's with a group one metal, which is not in this case, or it's not ammonium, uh, which is not here either. So this is going to lead to our solid that's being formed. Any questions on the solubility rules there? <clears throat> All right, so this would be our balanced equation here. 
And we're going to break this into our total ionic equation. So we do need to distribute that three to everybody. So this would actually give us six sodiums and three chromates. Once again, they should have charges. Again, we'll distribute the two that's in front. Gives us two of the iron threes plus six of the Br minuses. This will also break apart as it's a strong electrolyte, distributing the six to both sides. Gives us six of the sodiums plus six of the Br minuses. And our solid will once again stay together. Otherwise, it would not be a solid in this case. And this would be our total ionic equation in this case. Any questions on that one? So it's really important to keep uh, the coefficients and the subscripts to distribute so you end up with the correct amount on each side. It is from this equation that we can find our spectator ions, which in this case looks like it is six sodiums on each side. And looks like six of the Br minuses as well. Those are going to be our spectator ions. Again, exactly the same on both sides of the arrow. We're going to cross them out. And that again is going to leave us our net ionic equation, which is the iron is going to find the chromate. And they're going to come together to make this solid. Which would be our net ionic equation. Any questions on any of that? You can see the net ionic equation is balanced like a normal sort of equation, has the same number of elements on each side, actually also has the same overall charge on each side, zero on the left and zero on the right. Plus six minus six gives you zero. The match is zero that you have on the right. Any questions on how to write equations, double displacement equations, total ionic equations, net ionic equations, solubility rules? You can do, uh, you could do either. You, uh, if you circle them, then just, you know, put a little arrows as their spectator ions and stuff like that. Um, so I would uh, just make sure you, in addition to circle and make sure you identify them if you're asked to do so with them again. Other questions? And like I did here, uh, you don't necessarily have to put the coefficient, like, you know, there's two of them or six of them. You could just put what they are, the ions in this case. Other questions? <clears throat> You, you do when you do the net, well, I was talking about uh, when you identify like the spectator ions for that part. You don't have to put like, hey, there's two uh, potassiums or that. Uh, but definitely for the net ionic equation, all three, you should have the proper coefficients. So they all should always be balanced like any other equation. So if you're asked to write the molecular equation, it should be balanced with the proper coefficients. The total ionic equation should also be properly balanced with the right coefficients and so should the net ionic equation. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, then let's talk a little bit about acid and bases, which are also double displacement reactions. And we, again, uh, do see this type of equations uh, used for it, total ionic, net ionic. I think I mentioned earlier as well, we do also see net ionic uh, stuff written for redox reactions, but mainly they're used a lot for double displacement type reactions. So as we might have talked about, uh, acids, they have a sour taste. Uh, they do change litmus paper uh, colors. So if you have litmus paper and it basically becomes red, or if it stays red, it uh, usually means that that solution is acidic. Uh, they react with certain metals to produce hydrogen gas, like you've done over the number of labs, like you take some zinc and some hydrochloric acid. That is a single replacement reaction where the zinc will come in and kick out the hydrogen in this case, and it will make some zinc chloride plus some hydrogen gas. And that's the bubbles and stuff that you see, like those experiments where you had to put your thumb over the test tube and with the wooden splint type of deal. Um, aqueous ones will conduct electricity. So as we talked about earlier, strong acids are strong electrolytes and even weak acids are weak electrolytes which means they both will conduct electricity. 
Bases, on the other hand, have a bitter taste. A lot of soaps are bases, drain cleaner and stuff like that. Uh, they also turn litmus paper, but they turn it blue. Uh, so if you have litmus paper that turns blue or stays blue, it's going to be basic. And much like our acids, if you have a strong acid or a, I'm sorry, if you have a strong base or a weak base, they both will conduct electricity because they're both considered a strong electrolyte and a weak electrolyte as well. So what makes something an acid is the ability to produce hydrogen ions in solution. Hydrogen ions are sometimes referred to as protons. And that is because a hydrogen has uh, one proton, one electron, and it does not have a neutron. So in order for it to become positively charged, it had to lose an electron, which is why it is H+. When we talk about acid-base chemistry, oftentimes H+, and H3O plus are sort of used interchangeably, both in formulas and also equations. H plus is the hydrogen ion or a proton. This is a polyatomic ion, which is known as the hydronium ion. They both basically represent the acid part of the solution. And when you're really doing acid and base sort of chemistry, they are pretty much used you know, sort of interchangeably. As I put that list up earlier, those strong acids are really good ones to know. Again, they are strong electrolytes. So that's why something like nitric acid here, when they're in solution, you have that 100% of those ions floating around, produces a ton of H plus really, really quickly. And again, that is going to make that solution pretty acidic because you have a bunch of those H pluses floating around freely in that solution. As we talked about earlier, that weak acid will still be able to produce some H+, but nowhere to the extent of a strong acid is able to do so. Bases, on the other hand, are things that can produce hydroxide in solution. And it's kind of the same idea as an acid. It is the ability to produce free OH- in that solution floating around by itself is what makes something a base. And uh, strong bases typically will have hydroxide in the formula. And as I showed earlier, pretty much group one and group two, if you have any of those guys, especially towards the middle and down uh, that have hydroxide in it, uh, most likely going to be a strong base of so sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, 100% when it is in solution will pretty much break apart into those hydroxide ions. Really, the sodium and the potassium is just hanging out. It's just kind of floating around, not doing much in that solution in terms of the pH or if it's acidic or basic. It's really the presence of that hydroxide, uh, which is really important. That's also why that should be a plus. That's also why, as I showed earlier, ammonia, which does not have hydroxide but can react with water to produce some OH minus. Uh, is still considered a base. And I would say, again, that's probably your weakest base or most popular weak base that you'll come across, which is ammonia. And it's probably a fairly safe assumption that if you see something with hydroxide in it and definitely something from group one or two on the periodic table, that's going to be a strong base. So what happens when we react a strong acid and a strong base together? Whenever you take a strong acid and a strong base together, you will always produce two things. You will produce a salt and water. And a salt is an ionic compound. And obviously water is H2O. So for example, if we took hydrochloric acid and we reacted it with sodium hydroxide, this is a strong acid and a strong base. And it also is a double displacement reaction as those are two basically ionic guys coming together. And we're going to get the H and the OH switching partners. And then we're gonna get the sodium, the chloride coming together. That is going to form our water plus our sodium chloride. And that would be our molecular equation. We could also write a total ionic equation for this. And because that is a strong electrolyte, we would expect the HCl to break apart into H plus and Cl minus. 
the sodium hydroxide, which is a strong electrolyte, will also break apart. Water is a pure liquid, which means it is bound together through sharing of electrons. So it will stay together. So much like we did with the solid, if you have a liquid, it will stay together and water in this case would stay together. And our sodium chloride, which is our salt, will break apart as it is a strong electrolyte. And that's a salt and obviously water in this case. <clears throat> When we look at this, the sodium on both sides and the chloride on both sides are our spectator ions. And what that leaves us is the net ionic equation, pretty much no matter what combination of a strong acid and strong base that you put together, you will always end up with this exact same net ionic equation. It is basically the hydrogen from the acid coming together with the OH minus from the base to make water, which again is one of the three reasons why a reaction takes place is the formation of water. So again, you can put together any combination you like, strong acid, strong base. That is always the net ionic equation that you're going to hit at the end of it. Just like when you put together solutions that make a solid, you're going to hit